The Lord be with you. My word, if he's not now, I don't know what it'll take. So, We are in Genesis chapter 45 this morning. Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. Genesis chapter 45, beginning with verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have, I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Oh, great God. Give us now ears to hear what you would have us to hear. May we hear your words speaking to us through the words of Holy Scripture. And Lord, whatever words I put in the way to confuse us, Lord, may they be quickly forgotten. Speak to us now, Holy Spirit, that we may hear and we may obey. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Is there any more captivating motive for a good story other than revenge? I mean, think about it. Some of the best stories ever written are stories about revenge. It's nearly the perfect narrative driving force, whether it's a a story about a hero seeking retaliation against an enemy for a past injustice or a lover seeking retribution for the death of her beloved, or a child seeking to right the wrongs committed against his family. Revenge, boy, that's a great, great motivator for storytelling. It's wonderful. You can trace it all the way back through Western literature, at least, all the way back at least as far as the 8th century B.C., when that Greek poet Homer sat down to write the Iliad. There's revenge all over that story. Menelaus uh, seeks revenge against Paris for taking his wife Helen. Achilles hunts down Hector because Hector killed Achilles' friend Patroclus. Even the gods in the Iliad are are full of revenge as they go against one another, always trying to one-up one another for some bad thing one had done to the other. It's all over Homer's epic poem. But it's not just ancient Greek poems. And poets that are motivated by revenge. There's Shakespeare. 
and Hamlet. Why, that entire play is about nothing but revenge. Prince Hamlet is visited by the ghost of his father, tells him that Claudius, his uncle, has murdered him and taken his wife, and now Prince Hamlet must get his father's revenge. It's a great story, great play. But I know, if you're like me, if you've ever read the Iliad or Hamlet, it was in high school, right? I don't know of many of us who sit up at night reading uh, ancient Greek poetry, right? But I know, I know that you've probably heard of, maybe read, I know you've probably seen that novel from 1968. A novel millions have read, even millions more have seen. And either the 1969 adaptation with John Wayne or the 2010 adaptation with Jeff Bridges, which, by the way, I think is a slightly better adaptation uh, of that Charles Portis novel, True Grit. And that, the whole point of that story is a little 14-year-old girl named Maddie Ross enlists the help of a U.S. Marshal named Rooster Cogburn to track down Tom Chaney, who murdered her father in cold blood, stole his horse, his gun, and two gold pieces. And she wants revenge. But I doubt you will find any more compelling example of literary revenge than that of the Spanish swordsman whose father had made a sword of exquisite beauty and balance only to have his patron refuse to pay the agreed upon price and then strike him dead with his own sword. The son dedicated his life to revenge, always training, always studying, always practicing, determining to be the best swordsman in the world, so that if he ever came face to face with his father's murderer, with his sword in his hand, he'd look him straight in the eye and say, Hello, my name is Inigo Mantoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Now, those of you who aren't laughing have never read or seen The Princess Bride, yes? <laughs> Do yourself a favor, go home, watch it now. Most of us know the Carrie Ellis and Robin Wright movie, but it was, in fact, a novel written by William Goldman in 1973. And that's not even the main driving point of the story, but it's what keeps it alive. The story of revenge. Revenge, retaliation, retribution, reprisal, call it what you want, but it's a powerful force. And it can make for a captivating story. And the story before us this morning, the story of Joseph, has all the right pieces to be a captivating story about revenge. It's a story that really starts back in chapter 37 of Genesis. There, 17-year-old Joseph, J Daddy Jacob's favorite son, he was the oldest of his favorite wife, Rachel. Some say maybe he even had her eyes. But Jacob loved Joseph. Joseph starts dreaming having these odd dreams about his brothers all bowing down to worship him. Just imagine how that would go over if you have a, a bunch of kids and the youngest son starts telling all the older ones, yeah, you're going to bow down and worship me, right? Now, Joseph's brothers, they don't like this. They're already jealous of Joseph. Uh, Jacob had made him this, this long coat and long sleeves. It meant that he didn't have to work, right? Everybody else is out in the field. Here's Joseph walking around in a long coat with long sleeves. We say it's a coat of many colors, but probably just a long coat with long sleeves. He starts all this dreaming business. The brothers are already fed up with him, and so they decide to get rid of him. And they go down to Dothan. Not that Dothan. <laughs> it's actually the Dothan that that Dothan is named after, actually. But They go down to Dothan, and Joseph follows them down to Dothan. And in Dothan, they hatch this plan. And Joseph comes, and I love what they say. Here comes that dreamer. Here he comes. Let us kill him. Throw him into the pits. Let the wild animals tear him apart. And then we'll go back to daddy and say, we don't know what happened. He's just dead. But we don't have to worry about him anymore. But Reuben, Reuben is sort of taken with their, their little brother. He says, no, let's not kill him. Just throw him in the pit. Let him starve. They think that's a good idea. They throw Joseph in the pit, begin to have lunch. Reuben goes away. And then some Ishmaelites, some traders from Midian come by. And the brothers all say, hey, we could kill him and go back to dad. Or we could sell him, make some money. So they sell him to these Ishmaelites. 
for 20 pieces of silver. And then the Bible says they took Joseph to Egypt. Now the brothers initially wanted to kill Joseph, but instead wind up selling him for 20 pieces of silver. I don't care how much money that translates into today. I want you to hear me say, if you don't hear anything else, there is no amount of money for which you can sell another human being. Okay, I just want you to hear me say that in case you fall asleep later. So these traders take Joseph down to Egypt, the superpower of its day. And this, this is where the story, not just Joseph's story, but the story of the Bible really begins to take off. In the years ahead, Joseph becomes the slave of a man named Potiphar, the chief of Pharaoh's guards, and eventually he becomes the chief of Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife is so taken with Joseph that she tries to seduce him. But Joseph isn't having any of it, and so Potiphar's wife accuses him of rape, and it lands Joseph in prison. But Joseph is a, is a charismatic individual, one with natural abilities, and so the people in prison say, hey, this guy's pretty, pretty good, let's put him in charge of all the prisoners. And so one day, two prisoners from Pharaoh's court, his chief cupbearer and his chief baker, are thrown into prison with Joseph. And guess what? They have dreams. Do you remember what Joseph was good at? Dreams. And Joseph tells the baker, yeah, you're going to die. I mean, I don't want to hear that, right? If you want to interpret the dream that way, tell me I'm going to get like a bunch of ice cream or something. Don't tell me I'm going to die. But he tells the baker, you're going to die. But the cupbearer, he says, don't worry about it. You'll be reinstated to Pharaoh. And it does. The cupbearer goes back to Pharaoh. And on the way out of prison, Joseph says, hey, will you put in a good word for me with Pharaoh? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know what? He didn't. In fact, the Bible says the cupbearer forgot Joseph. Until about two years later, when Pharaoh starts having these weird dreams about cows. And nobody in all of Egypt can interpret the dreams, at least not to the way Pharaoh likes them. And then the cupbearer remembers, oh, yeah, there was Joseph back in prison. And so, prison, or so Joseph is summoned up to Pharaoh to interpret these dreams. And when his interpretations begin to come to fruition, Pharaoh gives him a great deal of power. He becomes the vizier of Egypt. That's a great title, by the way, vizier of Egypt. Now, are you still with me? The story's getting long, but Joseph's story is long, I promise during all that time, this has been over 20 years, two decades, Joseph has had the opportunity to plot his revenge. 20 years to think about what his brothers had done to him. 20 years to think about all that had happened. 20 years to digest all of this stuff, to wonder, when they show up, what am I going to do if I ever see them again? What am I going to do? And lo and behold, as the famine was starving so many to death, down from the north, came this little band of Hebrew brothers. They're Joseph's brothers. And he recognizes all of them. But they don't recognize him. Jacob had sent them to Egypt to buy food. They were starving. Egypt had put away all this grain because of Joseph's interpretation of the dreams of Pharaoh. And they came to buy food. And when they arrive, Joseph recognizes them has them imprisoned as spies, then demands that they bring their youngest brother, Benjamin, his only full brother with Jacob and Rachel, to bring them down to see him, to prove that they aren't these spies, that they're honest men. Now here, here is where the story has all this potential to be really gripping, where the opportunity for revenge is high. Because you see, they don't recognize Joseph, and he could have refused their petition for help. He's the vizier, remember? He's the one in charge of all of the grain stores in Egypt. He could have sent them away hungry. Joseph could have said, you know what? I remember what you did to me, and you'll never even know that I did it back to you. No, no food. Go starve to death up in Canaan. He could have done it. He had the power to do it. He was in charge of it. Even Pharaoh himself sent people. You want to get grain? Don't ask the Pharaoh. Go talk to Joseph. He could have stayed, refused their petition, uh, their petition, sent them away empty. But that's not what he does. What happens is that Joseph actually hears his brothers discussing in their own language. Oh, we really messed up. We really shouldn't have done this to Joseph. We think God might be, be punishing us for this. And Joseph hears it, weeps, and devises a plan. 
One that at first seems to lay a trap for his brothers. Now, I know it's getting long, right? Joseph's story is not, not one that goes from point A to point B. So Joseph sends his brothers back to Jacob with all these provisions and puts back in the bag the money that they had brought to pay for them. And when they get back and they're all eating the grain, having a good time, they realize, oh man, there's a lot of money in the bag. We didn't pay. The first thought is, well, we're not going to go right. Like it's kind of like if you go, to, go out to eat at lunch, they bring you your change back and it's more right, than what you paid. Do you go back or do you hold on to it and say, we just won't go eat there again, right? What do you do? But they run out of food. Jacob sends them back to Egypt, this time with Benjamin, to make sure they think that things are okay. When they get there, Joseph recognizes them again, sends them back home with double the money this time, puts a silver cup in Benjamin's bag, his personal cup, has them stopped, brings them back to his palace, seemingly to interrogate them, to imprison them. And they they come back. Willingly. Now, here is where the tension is thick in this story, right? I mean, they seem like they've gotten off the hook every time. Joseph seems to be playing, toying with his brothers, almost, almost as if he's torturing them with all these sort of head games, sending them back and forth, hiding things in their belongings. It's as if all of this is part of Joseph's plan for vengeance. After all, remember, he's justified in this. These are the same brothers who sought to kill him, who threw him in a pit, who sold him into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. These are the same brothers who were jealous of him because of his father's favoritism and his gifts for interpreting dreams. He's had over 20 years to plan this all out, 20 years to stew, 20 years to run the whole narrative over and over in his mind, 20 years in which he was dead to his father, 20 years without hearing people speak his native language, people who knew his story, who loved him for who he was and not what he could do for them. Joseph has had a long time to plot his revenge and to justify its outcome. And it seems that if it's likely to come together when the brothers are brought back before him and Joseph condemns Benjamin, condemns him to be his slave since it was in his belongings that he had found his silver cup. But Judah, one of the other brothers, pleads for Benjamin's life, says, take me instead. And that's, that's when our text begins. That's when Joseph... He can't hide it anymore. Joseph has all the power in this story. He has the power to refuse his brother's food that they need to survive, just as they had done to him when they threw him in the pit and they sat down to eat lunch. He has the power to imprison them with little more than a false charge, with fabricated evidence, in the same way that Joseph himself had been imprisoned from a charge from Potiphar's wife. He has the power to enslave them, just as he himself had been enslaved by the Ishmaelites and sold to the Egyptians. He has the power of Egypt at his disposal, the most powerful empire in the world. And Joseph could have had his revenge in whatever way he wanted, and no one would have batted an eye. But he doesn't. Instead, instead the Bible says Joseph could not control himself. He sends everyone away and he cries out so loudly that even those in Pharaoh's household could hear him. And he says to them, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And then he said to his brothers, come closer to me. I am your brother whom you sold into Egypt. But don't worry about it. Don't anger yourselves. Don't be distressed because you sold me here. God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph could have spent those 20 years looking back, plotting revenge, plotting all those things, but instead he's chosen to look back and see where God was turning all of those bad things around. He could have looked back and plotted it all and been right and justified in doing it. But instead, he decides, no, I'm going to look back and see where God has brought me here. Joseph doesn't get his revenge. He doesn't throw his brothers into prison. He doesn't enslave them. He doesn't send them away to starve or have them executed. No, what Joseph does is entirely different. 
He doesn't get revenge. He forgives them. He's reconciled to them. But why? Why? Why after all they have done, after all that he had been through, after living so long without his family, without being able to hear the voice of his father, why? After all of this time, why not get the revenge he so clearly deserved? Maybe, just maybe, Joseph realized the one thing we human beings still struggle to understand. That the power of revenge, the power of retaliation, is nothing, nothing at all when compared to the power of forgiveness and reconciliation. After all, what good does revenge do? What good is it holding a grudge? What good is it to seek retribution or wanting reprisal? Does it ever solve anything? Does it ever erase the pain? Does it have the power to wind back the clock and do things over? No. Does retaliation ever lead to anything more than escalation and deeper division? No. But forgiveness, (coughs) reconciliation, that's where the power is. While revenge only leaves us with maybe at best a momentary feeling of justice, forgiveness, Forgiveness and reconciliation lead to healing, to making things whole and right once more. Holding on to anger only corrodes the soul and leaves us viewing a brother, a sister, or a friend, a neighbor as less than what God has created them to be. But forgiveness, forgiveness restores a lost brother, it finds an old friend, it redeems a neighbor. It creates space for the kingdom of God to be more fully realized. But is it easy? No. Is it worth it? Always. And thanks be to God that God doesn't seek retaliation against me or you because it doesn't go anywhere. What God seeks is reconciliation. So let go. This morning, let go of whatever it is that is corroding your soul. Whatever anger, whatever vengeance you seek, let go of it. Whatever grudge you may be holding, let go. It doesn't do any good to anybody. Let go of it. No matter how long it's been, to whom you need to be reconciled, don't let the sun go down on this day until you've begun the worthwhile work of being reconciled to them. For there's no power, no power, no matter how much you try to fool yourself or others do too, there is no power in holding on to hate, no power in holding on to a grudge, no power in holding on to the hope that there's a chance I might get even. But my Lord, what power there is in forgiveness. What power there is in being reconciled. What power there is when you set aside the desire to get even and the desire to simply just get right with somebody. What power there is in being reconciled to each other. It's the very power of God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord. When we spend our time, our effort, our energy focused on retaliation, when we give so much of our life over to anger, holding a grudge, stewing over things over and over in our minds, God, when you call us, to reconciliation. When you call us to forgiveness, not only to you, but to one another. Lord, help us to seek to do the hard work of being reconciled to our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, Lord, even our enemies. 
Give us the power, Lord, to do that. Power that can only come from you and not from ourselves. And Lord, at this time and this place, if there is any decision any of us need to make, or any decision we need to make public to this congregation, to ourselves, to one another, Holy Spirit, give us the courage to make that decision known today. Be with us, Lord, in this time of response. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.